G'day and welcome to the Celtic Down Under podcast. I'm your host, Jared, and joining me tonight are Sean and Liam. How are you, Liam? Oh, well, I got some uh, I got some grim news at the weekend there. You know, uh, one of my friends back in Scotland phoned me up and says, mate, I'm, I'm in a bad place. I says, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, do you, do you, need, do you need, a, need some help mentally? He's like, no, 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 not mentally. Just I'm with the wife at Ibrox for the Harry Styles concert. You knew exactly where you were going with that one, Liam. Yeah, so like, that's yeah. it. Use the drums. You got to do it. And how are you, Sean? Yeah, good. There was a chance a guy the other day that was born with five dicks, five penises. I asked him how his under, how, how said how do your underpants fit? He said like a glove. <laughs> uh, anyway. Anyway, if you're still listening, if you're still listening <laughs> thanks for that. You're hanging in there. And, um, so this episode is just uh, part two of our um, basically Some... series that we're doing on modernising Celtic. So tonight on this episode, we'll be talking about the Youth Academy and the match day experience. So Sean will be taking the lead on both of them topics. So what we'll do is we'll throw to you, Sean. Okay. Uh, first one. Um Colts team. So I did a, a bit of research uh, on this one, so I will actually spare you most of the details. But it appears that uh, our current youth academy structure consists of 24 staff headed up by Chris McCart, uh, spread across uh, a variety of age ranges from under 11s up to the Colts team. Uh, Colts team being uh, either under 18s or B team, depending on uh, what division they're playing in in that year. Uh, so, funded by Celtic Pools, and for the last 10 years, we've had a, a partnership with St. Ninians. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but they do a special curriculum where they can train at the school three times per week with their coaches, and after school at Lennox Town, four times a week. And the academy stated goal is to develop Champions League players. There is actual stats uh, on the Celtic website uh, to this end, uh, which have been recorded since the year 2000. So I'm not sure if that's when the academy officially started, but in its current iteration, it's about 10 years old, the St. Ninians. So how many players do you reckon have made the first team since the year 2000? Hmm. I assume assume means made a first team appearance. Based, I'm assuming. So even if it's even if it's twenty seconds off the bench, that still counts, right? I'm assuming that's what it means. That's what's implied. Uh, I'd say about mm-hmm. seventy-five. Jared, twenty-one. It's fifty-one. So fifty-one first team players. So obviously that includes the likes of like Owen Moffat, who's played like two games or whatever. Uh, and then how many, and with the, the stated goal of developing Champions League players, how many do you think have played in the Champions League? I'm going to stay with 21 then. I'll say 18. It's 19. 19. So, so they don't give the names, and I don't know, if it doesn't actually say if that includes teams that are not Celtic, uh, you know, like Jack Henry or whatever. Uh, how many do you reckon have become full internationals? Former Academy. That's that's a doozy because it's um also means guys who were in our academy have left, gone elsewhere and come back like, and have made their debut. So that's where it gets tricky because yep. you've got guys like um what was that centre back who was at Motherwell? Who then went up to Aberdeen. I can't remember who was a centre back of Scotland. So he'd count as one. Um, I don't know. I mean, Are you, you reckon about Declan Gallagher? That's the one. Yeah, mm-hmm. guys like that yeah. would count. Probably, yeah. Andrew Robertson. People Robertson would count. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Forty-two. There you go. It's double my previous. I'll say thirty-three. It was forty-one. Good guess, Jared. And and overall, the stats show that apparently one in three of the academy players have become professional footballers. So, would you consider that if with the stated goal? to develop Champions League players. So since 2000, we've had 19 Champions League players. So that's just under one per year. Would you consider that a measure of success? I don't know what they consider their metric of success to be, but would you consider that success? 
No. Nah. Well, it's all a question of volume. I mean, the likes of Man City and Chelsea probably have a similar hit rate, but they go through a much bigger volume of players than we do. So... And that's why I said no, Liam, so quickly, because I'm great and thinking the same thing. If we've uh, got a squad of maybe 50 players or a pool of 70 players and 19 are making it, that's a decent amount. But then, you know, you've got to have a lot of, you know, a lot of irons in the fire to make that Kieran Tierney type. Mm. You always have to think that teams like Chelsea will chuck on Billy Gilmore in a Champions League game against the second best team in Turkey, because for them, that's a step down from their Saturday games. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, so for uh, us, it's, you know, it's a step up, but for them, it's just like, you know. Aye, they're not necessarily going to play the strongest 11 in every Champions League game, whereas we would get hounded if we didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I would say, I would say a qualified success mm -hmm. because it's also down to how often have we been in the Champions League in the last, since 2000, and that's definitely not been every year. You know, there's been plenty of years where we flopped in the qualifiers or what have you. So, mm -hmm. the reason, so I said, the reason yeah. I said no there, sorry, Sean, was because okay, we've had Tierney come in; he's proven he can do it at that level. Okay, so here's the exception to the rule: Jamesy Forrest has done it. Here's an exception: those two, there's 17 left over. I don't see guys like Stephen Welsh. I don't see guys like. Uh, Mikey Johnson, those sort of guys coming through and cutting the mustard at that level. I don't see Karamoko doing it, even though he's playing it, played for us in Europe. That's the difference because these guys have made it, they've made a match day squad and played in the Champions League for Celtic. That's all well and good. But, you know, Ada McGeady did well in Europe. That's great. But who else has? Who's come in and done mm -hmm. it well for us for a long period? That's the. That's why yeah. I think it's clear because there's guys coming in and playing, but just because they're playing the games that pushing the stats up doesn't necessarily mean that these are guys who are impacting the first team squad in Europe at that level. Yeah, and look, if you run down the list of success stories that are actually listed on the website, you've got like, well, I'll just give you names. It's Forrest, um, James Forrest, Callum McGregor, Mikey Johnston. This is the order they give it in. Uh, Kieran Tierney, Sean Maloney, Aidan McGeady, Charlie Mulgrew, John Kennedy. Steve McManus and Darren O'Day. So, so apart from Mikey Johnston, you would say they have all contributed in Europe. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I guess Mikey's done it in some qualifiers and stuff. But yeah, so they're given ten names there as ones that you might actually qualify, and not ones like Tony Ralston who got stood on by Neymar or whatever. You know, um, yeah, I don't know. Would Liam Miller count, for example? I don't know. Colin Healy, he's probably played a Champions League game. You know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how they're really calculating it. But it's interesting as well because it's really just a very simple way to measure what is not a simple thing to measure. Um, you know, like, do you count uh, Callum McGregor and James Forrest's trophy count as a measure of success? Uh, do you count Callum McGregor being the club captain and being on 25 grand a week as a measure of success? Do you count international caps? Do you count or do you count that Kieran Tierney sold for £25 million pounds and probably made back 10 years' worth of academy investment in one transfer? Like, There's a lot of complexity that goes into measuring this, right? Yeah, and there's also the fact that no matter how many players you burn through, for example, I would say it's worth having 100 that don't make the grade if, it, if, if that process will get us one Callum McGregor or Kieran Tierney, you know? And financially, that probably makes sense from Celtic's point of view as well, just in terms of the resale value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And and what's uh, Aberdeen demanding for Calvin Ramsey right now? Ten million? They're asking for Liverpool from. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. That that's on literally a on a positive though. It's good to see teams in Scotland are starting to ask for higher figures. In teams in England for their players about bloody time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if, if Calvin Ramsey's 18, then that makes sense because he can qualify in the long run as a uh, a homegrown player for Liverpool. Uh, he has 18, so that might be why they can demand so much because he would count as a Champions League um, homegrown player for them. 
if they bring him in now, which is I think why they paid why they bought Danny Wilson from Sevco in the first place. Remember that one? Yeah. That was a funny, funny transfer in the long run. Uh, he couldn't get a game for Hearts when he came back up. Uh, and I'm actually going to talk more about that later, so I'm not going to dwell on it now. Uh, but yeah, there's other aspects to our academy as well. We also have the Asia Pacific Academy. Now that's We have 10 partners in Australia, Kuwait, Malaysia and China, uh, which offer coaching, education, team training and player development. Now it's mostly online. Uh, the other aspects of our some of our coaches do fly out to these countries to do coaching sessions, once uh, a year. and I, I think it's kind of on request rather than a once a year kind of thing. So like well, I've seen it. Yeah, we haven't twice a year out here in Melbourne. Yeah, and look, we have like so in, in Perth, we have like West Ham will come out once a year. Everton, will, uh, Stoke send somebody out once. A, so like all kinds of teams do it in whatever level of periodicity. Uh, and the idea is, uh, I, I believe the idea is that you might find a hidden gem or you might create like a, a psychological link with a, a future star kind of thing. Uh, is, is that right, Jared? Is that with how it's portrayed in Melbourne? Or No, how it's done is there's a few clubs over here that are part of the um, Celtic Academy. And there's a thing where like the, the, the clubs have got links to the academy set up. It's like the people who run it. So they come out here twice a year and they'll run like during school holidays and they'll run like a week long um, okay. camp. So if you're picked or if you pay, like if you pay and you want to go, you can do it. But then there's also certain players who are selected from certain clubs that are also linked with it that go in there and they train and they do all that side of it. And then at the end of the camp, two players on the men's and two on the women's side get invited to go back to Glasgow. Mm-hmm. For, a, for like a trial yeah that, that was the third aspect i was going to mention that they do have um some people do get flown over for the match day experience and things like that so uh, do you know what age groups that is, 12s, is it just random? 11 12 through to like 16 18 something like that okay so it is really getting them young i also noticed when i was going on it in the website that paul mcstay is in charge of the one in sydney which is interesting yep so that was it- yeah. Something you raised there which just kind of piqued my interest a wee bit. It seems strange to think that we've got a presence in China but not in Japan or Korea. Whereas Japan and Korea consistently are both statistically more likely to produce world class players than China is. You know, that's well, shouldn't you be going for the untapped market, isn't that the point? Well, but there's difference between an untapped market and a completely undeveloped infrastructure. I mean China mm-hmm. just hasn't really it china is now where the usa was maybe like 40 years ago in terms of football development they're not it's not a major issue over there the only thing they do is is import expensive uh foreign players on sort of you know mercenary contracts like um you know for about the first five years of the j league they did the same here but they very quickly moved it on to developing japanese talent and that is why japan's been at every world cup since 1998 um and i think that you know i I just i just think that celtic could do a hell of a lot that that whatever money they're putting into china would go a lot further if it was put into korea and or japan instead you know maybe looking at it going there's a billion people in china we might we might be able to find one or two here yeah what one is born with it kind of thing yeah (laughs) Uh, and look, to, to support what you're saying, Liam, and also to mm-hmm. argue against it, depending on how you take this, uh, yeah. look look at uh, the shocking infrastructure in a country like Brazil and the players that they produce. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no guarantee that better infrastructure is going to lead to better players or vice versa. But mm-hmm. I just think that if you're looking to tap into the Asian market, obviously Celtic last year, blew the lid off the J-League because they showed that you can get some really class players there, which I think was an untapped resource, but we've kind of played that hand now and other people are going to be looking at it. Whereas I think Korea is still relatively untapped and China, there's a a debate to be had there as to is it untapped or is it just not ready to be tapped, I think, is is the point I'm trying to make. I will say... um in support of the argument, whether it's mine or not, 
that you can find hidden talent is if you look at any country when they get awarded the Olympics, all these people emerge that become like bronze, silver and gold medal athletes and and events that they wouldn't have even tried uh, with it, were it not for their country uh, hosting the Olympics and chucking funding at training for that, you know? Mm. Um, that's why every time a, an Olympics goes to a country, they end up like third on the medal table, whereas previous years they'd have been like down in 11. Uh, so there's some clear stats in terms of uh, Olympic athletes that, um, you know, looking and training people, you will find people that didn't know they had a the talent in an area. Mm. Aye, I mean, that, that is that is a valid point for sure. Um, I've mm. seen that actually in Japan with the, with the Tokyo Olympics. There was a few sports which I've never actually, I'd never actually even seen being played in Japan before and people were getting gold medals, you know, skateboarding and things like that, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that the Olympics now? Jesus. Come on. Got to keep flipping, keep flipping ollies and stuff, mate. <laughs> Leave Ollie I, alone. The, the, the girl who got the gold was like 13 or something. It was like, the, they're really, really young in that as well. Um, yeah, that's because they're all like, busted up their legs and ankles by the time they're like 20. <laughs> I'd love to see for the, the, the horse dressage that the horse actually goes on the podium instead of the from jockey that's whipping them. <laughs> you know I mean? like, give the horse a giant medal. You're the one that did everything. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Um, the, so that's the academy. Unless you guys have anything to add on that, I was going to move on to player retention. Um, Go for it. I okay. So the other aspects of uh, academy stuff that one to a couple of things but the next one i looked at was player retention and we all kind of this is in the last couple of years is, is quite a a high profile issue uh in this to the extent that when poster coglu started last year one of his publicly stated goals was retaining more young players okay uh and to kind of link to the previous topic about how we measure the success of the academy i did wonder to myself is players being poached not also a measure of success of our academy, whereas they wouldn't have been before? So it seems like this is, like, apart from Islam Farouz in 2014, it seems like this has all happened in the last three years. So is that not a measure of success also? If you know what I mean. Yeah. I get what you're saying. It's, um, it's catch-22. you got the players, you got the facilities, you're developing the, a good quality amount of players. But then there's no pathway for them into the first team. They, they you know, leave. Of course, of course, but nobody was... We'd, we'd never had a pathway, but players weren't yeah. being poached before 2019, okay. you know. I know all I'm saying is, like, it shows that that's actually a good thing, like, in regard that, okay, we're developing at a good level. So if we can't so, get these guys into our team that because there's that pathway is not there, clubs like Bayern Munich are looking at us for players. Or Man City are looking at us for players, or Liverpool's looking at us. It's like it's a nice compliment to what the job you guys are doing, but at the same time, we get absolutely bugger all money when we lose a player in that situation. And when they make their move in the future, we're just going to get it cents on the dollar sort of return. So it's it's good in the way because it shows we're doing a good job, but at the same time, I'm not a massive fan of it because we're we're losing out long term. I uh, see that that that's kind of my issue with it as well is that developing players that can then be sold on is not as financially viable as it used to be because the rules have been changed. Um, I mean, again, just a personal opinion, but I think football needs something like the update that you've seen to copyright laws in recent times in the, in the in the states, whereby if you if you sell in, in that case you know the the rights to a, a film or a book or something and then it goes on to make much more money than you ever expected it could you're you're then entitled to a share of that future profit or you're entitled to take the rights back after a certain number of years um in recent people can look this up recent examples being like for example the predator franchise and the uh, I think the, the character of Superman has had that issue back and forth with rights as well. But to link that, to, to, to go into what I'm talking about with Celtic, like if we lose an academy player at, say, 16 or 17 years old for a nominal development fee, 
but then he goes on to change hands and go to Barcelona for like 50 million in like five years down the line. We should get a significant cut of that as the as the team that actually produced the player. But under the current rules, we don't. Yeah, no, I'm not. That's not really what I'm trying. To, yeah, I agree, Liam. And that's mm. more of a wider issue than a Celtic issue. Uh, and, and you're right, it's not just a Celtic problem that that, that can and does happen. Uh, That's the again, communist lame coming at you. <laughs> uh, yeah, socialist. And I get no. I guess the point I was trying to make is that, like, between two thousand and two thousand and nineteen, there was like Islam Farouz and nobody else was poached. Mm. And then since two thousand and nineteen, let me give you the list of players since two thousand and nineteen. Uh, we've had Liam Morrison went to Bayern Munich. Uh, Josh Did Adams. Heartbreaking. Sorry. So I got the tissues ready because it's oh, hard. Tissues, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why. Uh, Josh Adam <laughs> to man. <laughs> see a pot noodle as well. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say there's, there's room for a pot noodle there. Anyway. Uh, jo- <laughs> so Liam Morrison to Bayern Munich. Uh, Josh Adam to Man City. Barry Hepburn to Bayern Munich. Uh, Armstrong Okoflex to West Ham. You could argue that one. Uh, Liam Hughes to Liverpool. Cameron Harper to New York Red Bulls, Leo Hield to Leeds, Vincent Angelia, Angelia to Watford, Ben Doak to Liverpool, and wherever Karamoko Dembele is choosing to go. So, so one, two, three, four, five, uh, nine players uh, since 2019, whereas in the 19 years before that, there was one of note. So, okay, so let's just look at something there, Sean. That list that you went through? Yeah. That that squad there would probably be good enough to finish top six in the Scottish Premiership. Probably. Mm. Apart from the fact there's two goalkeepers, but yeah, you're right. In yeah. terms of standards, I know, yeah. What I'm saying is if you had that and then you chucked a couple others in, it's still scary. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Because, yeah, and I was I, well looking at this list, I was kind of looking at what their recent outcomes are as well. Uh, Josh Adam is the under-18s uh, EPL champion playing centre mid. Uh Barry Hepburn is getting a game for under, and Liam Morrison are both playing in Bayern Munich under 19s. Okoflex has had a couple of League Cup appearances and a goal for West Ham. So he scored a senior goal for West Ham. Who, what did they finish? Seventh in the league or something? I don't know. Uh, Cameron Harper's made scored a goal in 11 first team appearances for New York. Leo Hield's had a couple of EPL appearances for Leeds. Uh, Vincent Angelia's been on the bench for three EPL games. Uh, and Ben Doak is allegedly on £12,000 per week at Liverpool. Uh, the only one that's really shown as a failure there is Liam Hughes, who is apparently just making up the numbers at training. Uh, literally, that's what they're saying. They literally have him listed as a training player. <laughs> uh, and he went on loan to a seventh tier team. So that's, yeah, as you say, Jared, apart from Liam Hughes, they all, I mean, it's too too early to call them successes, but there's certainly no lack of quality there. I mean, our B team would have ripped... If they were our B team this year, they would have ripped that little in league apart, right? Yeah. Aye, no question. Um, yeah. And and as as we finish joint... Well, third, but set behind Sevco and goal difference in the Lowland League. Mm. Who were second. See, I think and, there's actually a parallel here where when you look at you know all the all the headlines last season about how Celtic buy, buying all these Japanese players was an untapped resource. I think the fact that so many of these deals have happened so recently tells you that Celtic's youth academy, and to a lesser extent, Scottish youth in general, is for England an untapped resource that they are starting to tap into now, and for Bayern Munich as well, by the looks of it. But. Say it, Liam, since Brexit, they're coming and looking at us more because, <laughs> you know, they don't need work permits and stuff. Well, aye. Basically, yeah. That, that's the reality. Um, it's a lot logistically easier to sign a young Scottish player than it is to sign a young French or German player now, thanks to Boris and his mates. So, yeah. And look, we're not the only team that's looking at player retention. Queen's Park turned professional after 160 years of being amateur. Uh, so that they could keep players like Andrew Robertson and um, uh, Lauren Shankland and a- uh, Aidan Connolly. Uh, th- these are all players that like they had to lose on a free because of their amateur status. They could have had like 
seven figures at least for those players just for development. And now they've gone professional, they will. They will get that. So they've they've taken that move because of that reason. Uh, so we need to think about what we can do for player retention. And look, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what's happening in the background. But I, I've got a list of three uh, in the last half a year. So Matthew, well, last year, Matty Anderson, we talked about in the last uh, episode. Jared, Ando. Uh, yeah, he, that's a new guy. Yeah, we, he's, we, he was a uh, lead to try to get him, and we've kept him uh, left back. So there's one success retained. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Daniel Kelly, uh, chased by Arsenal particularly, also Liverpool, Wolves, Spurs. Uh, new three-year contract. He's 16 years old. Mitchell Frame, another left back. Chased by Palace, Tottenham Wolves. Not signed the new contract yet, but apparently is. So there's three right now that uh, probably last year would have been gone that we're now keeping. So maybe, maybe we're turning it around now. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, they can yeah. say there's a pathway. You know, you go from the youth academy to the Colts team. And then from the Colts team, you either go on loan or you come to come in and be, you know, one of the depth players in our senior squad. Yeah, and look, I think maybe the pathway, the pathway, and we keep saying this word pathway, and you're right, it's because when they go to these bigger teams, like it's laid out for them, like it's on paper, like this is your pathway. And we don't really have that. And, and part of the reason is that we don't even know if we're going to have a coach team in the Lowland League next year. Do you know what I mean? Like we, it was it was only decided last week that we're going to have one this year. So there's there's no certainty, there's no clarity. Uh, so, so you can't blame them entirely for that, you know. I, I think my my idea uh, for this is we should do two things. So one is we need to improve. So we've got 24 staff. I think we need to increase that by at least 10 to 12 coaches, okay? Uh, whether that's in specific areas like sports science or whatever is up for debate. But I think we need to increase the number of coaching staff, okay? And the reason for that being that players can get more feedback, okay? And the more feedback you get, the more... so. It feels sometimes just like players are like, yeah, see how you go. You either get better or you don't. You sink or swim. You know, like you just play more games, play against men, you're going to get better. That seems to be a narrative a lot of the time. Whereas what it should be is uh, the same thing that the first team players get. First team players get, you know, their heat maps. Okay, you weren't tracking back here. Or you're not, uh, you're spending too much time in this position. You know, the really, really specific goals. In teaching, we call it SMART, uh, as in your goals have to be specific, measurable, achievable, um, relevant, and time-based. As in, you need to be doing this by three months' time, or you need to have scored this many goals or this many appearances time uh, within a time frame. If we can start getting more coaches, give much more specific feedback, it's not just a question. So then when a player goes, why am I not in the first team? You can go, you didn't achieve this goal. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, you didn't get your body mass to 71 kilograms. It doesn't have to be goals and assists. There's lots of ways to measure these targets. And That's I think if... Difficult. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, if it's measurable, you can point to it. And that way, when a player is getting frustrated, they go, well, it's your responsibility. You didn't hit these goals. Yeah? And anything you hit one, you just add a new one. It's not, oh, you've hit your goal. You're now a first team player. Okay, good. You're almost there. Next one is. Da, da, da. Do you know what I'm saying? You just keep giving them areas for improvement. And this is a thing we do in teaching is... There's always an area for improvement. And that way, uh, if somebody's getting frustrated, you know what you need to do. You know what's your next step. Yeah. And I think, so, well, actually, I'll let you guys comment on that first. I have a second solution, but that's the second thing that we need to do. But that's, what do you think about that? Well, as a, as a teacher myself as well, the smart goals thing makes a lot of sense. Um mm -hmm. It's um because it's 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 about the uh, the idea of motivation as well. Like if you've got a player who thinks I'm doing all right, why am I not getting a game? Um, you know why am I not making the next step up on the pathway? Then you actually have a data based answer to their question. Say, well, look, you need to do this, or you failed to do this by this time period. You know it, it's. It's it's um directed feedback is what well, what we call it in, in in English teacher training. Um, it's like you know if you just say to your kid that's wrong, they're like all right okay. You say no, it's wrong because you need to do this this and this. Mm -hmm. Then that is much more 
it's much more progressive and it, 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 it pushes them on. It motivates them much more as well because they specifically know what they have to do and how they can do it. Um, that is something that's really starting to take hold here in Japan, actually, in sports coaching as well, is the old Japanese style of just, like, you know, copy the teacher or the sensei, as they would call it, um, is not really conducive to modern sports science. Whereas instead, this idea of, like, targeted specific goals is definitely something that's catching on. And I think, like you say, Sean, it works in teaching. I think it would work in youth development in football as well. Well, we had it over here with... um. Like I used to coach state league basketball and everything, and one of the things we always said, told when we're doing our coaching badges, and that was, don't just instruct, give them the why. Oh. So that's what I'm seeing. This is like you guys are saying smart. For me, it's like the thing is, you, the pathway is you've got these eleven steps you need to get through. Once you get, like you've got a time frame. You need to do this within three months. Why? Because then this means you're decision making will improve then the next step is this you need to get your body mass to a certain level because that will help you take bumps at the next level against bigger athletes and you just bit by bit by bit and you tell them what it is like as you're saying make it measurable make it realistic or relevant you tell them what it is and the, the why this is why you're going to do it and suddenly you'll get a lot more buy-in so yeah i think it makes sense to do that sean and to me this is all comes down to we have 24 staff in our academy how can they be managing under 11 to under 18 to that level of detail with 24 staff? I don't see how it's possible. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Just those numbers don't make sense to me. They need a lot more coaches. Let's be let's be real about it here. Yeah. yeah. If you look at Man City, right? Like uh, Every team that trains within, I can't remember where their training base is, but like every player that trains there, like when they come out of training, they all have like a so they've got like these like, do you know how those IKEA shelves you get? Like it's the square blocks. So they have like one with their name on it. And when they come off training, they all have their own individual specifically made milkshake or whatever it is, protein shake, made by like a, a club doctor. It's like, oh yeah, this one's yours. This is what you need today, kind of thing. Like that's the kind of level of attention to detail. We've, since Brendan Rogers came in, we've made a lot of strides in improving the culture of the young players. Because it used to be as soon as they trained with the first team, they were out. At, you know the garage nightclub, uh, acting Billy Big Boss, uh, pulling all the girls, saying I play for Celtic, getting pissed. I think Aidan McGeady, for example. Uh, and now it seems like players like Kieran Tierney. I don't know. If, I don't know if Kieran Tierney's ever touched a drink or seen a nightclub. Like he was just a dedicated professional. So there has been a, a kind of culture, what we call it shift, but culture change that really helps things. You know as well. But these guys need to realise they are full time professional athletes, and full time is a is full time. It's not you know you show up and play on a Saturday like Lee Griffiths might think. That's yeah. why the people like him are no longer at the club because yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. You, you, nowadays you're going to get found out. Simple as that, right? Unless yeah, you're playing ten, some. Ten years know. ago, we probably got away with it, but not. Yeah. Not anymore. And um, yeah, exactly. And my uh, my second and big idea that I had was, while the Scottish Lowland League is much better than what we had before, I think what we should actually be doing is getting that B slash coach team into the EPL two, the English Premier Reserve League. Okay, and I, I didn't actually think of that idea until today when I was researching what players like Oakleflex are doing and Josh Adam are doing. And it seems like that, that EPL2 is actually a very high standard of player. Like that's the sort of, th those are what you would consider to be their, their contemporaries. That's like the next level up for them. And you would actually, I think you would consider any like particular, like a, a Man City or Man United EPL2 team to be better than any English champ, uh, Scottish championship team, right? Mm. But that's your kind of level, right? And And if you've got like, you know, it's like Brentford's EPL2 team is probably more like a League One level or whatever. But either way, it's all higher than the Lowland League level, right? And you're also getting them, you know, uh, and I, I don't know. Like that, to me, that seems like a better idea than uh, playing in the Lowland League. From the EPL2's point of view as well, from a marketing point of view, having 
Celtic and I would assume the Huns as well on board with that would give them an extra selling point for what is probably quite a hard sell for uh, Sky Sports or whatever at the moment as in trying to get media coverage for it you know mm -hmm. yeah Jared? I like the idea um, however you know we're going to have comments Sean because it's the first, people are going to say that's the first step towards Celtic and Rangers moving down there and all that sort of shite that's been getting spoken about for years about us going to the EPL. So I like the idea. I think it makes perfect sense from a youth development thing, but I'm just looking at it going, I can just wait for the comments. Start blowing up my phone once this is out. <laughs> well, I'm definitely not suggesting the first team move. That's not what I'm stressing. But I think that the, the B team should be doing that. I think it'd be great, to be honest. It's and I actually think the, the players would love the experience as well. I think it'd be a, a good thing for keeping players. Like, if a player's going to, you know, like, if a player going to leave Celtic to go play in a different EPL2 team, do you know what I mean? Like, with Oakleflex, he's playing EPL2 for West Ham. He, he could just be playing EPL2 for Celtic, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's a sideways move at that point. Aye, at that level, play. there's not much difference because you're always playing at the same level. And you're probably yeah. making about the same money. Aye. On that, Sean, as well, would that have been better for someone like Karamoko instead of just sitting on the bench not playing for th two, three years, mm -hmm. to been down there playing in that league from about the age of 15, mm -hmm. getting three, four years' experience at that level? Of course it would have been better for him. And, and the likes of Karamoko, he's not going to get the hatchet job that he'll probably get against someone like, and I don't know that, just random name, like uh, Dalbiti Star, for example. Like the fullback for Dalbiti Star is going to be like, yeah, I'm going to teach this kid a lesson. Whereas if he's up against contemporaries from like uh, whatever, like uh, Aston Villa's B team, there's there's going to be a professional respect there, you know, like that. And also, apart from just the higher level of quality. Aye, I think that's the big problem with the Lowland League or putting a Colts team into a lower league. You quite you, you know it's quite often that in like the cups, you know, the Scottish Cup for or the League Cup, for example, the the Celtic and Rangers B teams generally don't get very far because as soon as they meet a team that can outgun them physically, then the skill level goes out the window, and you they come up against hammer throwers who will just put them off the park. Um, Whereas if you're in a league where everybody is at that same stage of development, there isn't going to be that same hammer throw mentality, not just because it's a better standard of football, but because every team in the league is looking to get the same thing out of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Lowland League, a lot of them are like, I want to kick a, I want to kick a Celtic player. You know, that's yeah. basically it. You know? <laughs> and, and you're making a joke about that, but we see it in... You know, you see it in the SPFL, like players like Paul Patton, uh, Paul Payton yeah. for Dundee United, he would get booked in every single game against Celtic. You know, like, yeah. he knew it was coming. Like, yeah, we joke about it, but also it's a part of the, a negative part of the culture, right? Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong. If I was playing for some junior team and we, we drew Rangers in the cup, I would just love to be able to tell my mates in the pub that night that I booted a hun up the arse. You know what I mean? I can definitely understand the the uh, the attraction of it if you're that way inclined. You know? Yeah, and look, and when you retire and you're talking to your grandkids, you're not going to tell them about all the goals you scored. You're going to tell them you got a yellow card, but in a hun. I mean, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've got a segue to the next topic. So any, before I bring that up, is there anything you, else you guys want to mention about the academy or the Colts? With the thing you just brought up about the EPL too, like, mm -hmm. that's such a left field thing. I actually like that because my thing I've been talking about is, and we've had this brought up on a few of our Tim Talk podcasts, is that, you know, about possibly getting a few preferred clubs that you'd know and trust their development and their facilities that you'd get guys in the Colts and then loan them out to these preferred clubs for a season or two and then bring them back to us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another possibility instead of the preferred club thing so yeah, it's a good idea a bit left field but i like it yeah i've not heard it mentioned before it just it was just when i was looking at what our poached players are doing that i, I was like why, why are we not in that do you mean like it's just perfect right Aye. yeah yeah and only it kind of links the only problem is the a in the title that's it yeah yeah but it's not governed by fifa right so we can still we can do cross border with that like the challenge cup like we do that cross border Should be able, yeah yeah. So th that kind of links as well to the segue, which I, I have to the next section, which is my final point on how the Colts can improve. 
and that's by no longer playing at Airdrie, but by playing on grass. Okay, so that's again another thing you'd be getting in EPL2 is games on grass rather than AstroTurf. Okay, no use really in playing on AstroTurf, eh, AstroTurf every week and then expecting players to go play on grass when they make the first team step up. That's going to be a challenge for the likes of Owen Moffat. Uh, and that kind of linked to uh, the next topic, which was match day experience. Now, it links in the sense that uh, one of the ideas that I had for improving match day experience uh, was something we've actually discussed before. Uh, and that was uh, around the idea of having a double match day. So, uh, for example, they've talked about uh, modernizing Battlefield. So if you have your Celtic first team game Saturday, three o'clock, if you then have the Colts or even the women playing at noon before the game, then you could get people going along there three hours before kickoff. Say you have free, en free entry for kids, five pounds for adults, licensed bar, TVs showing whatever other midday game is on, like EPL or the Hun game. You have a shuttle bus running from Battlefield to Celtic Park at the end of the game. I reckon you easily get 500 to 2,000 people attending that. Yeah, that's to me, that's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. Um, I mean, if you spaced out the kickoff time slot enough, you could even walk from Barrowfield to Celtic Park. It's only about a 20-minute walk. Yeah. Um, that was my but, question. I was going to ask is how far is Barrowfield from Celtic Park? Well, well in, a, in a crowd that's about half an hour but yeah it's a 20 minute walk if there's no if the streets are clear but yeah it would take you about 40 minutes to get to your seat from Barrowfield. Uh, i would say if we had like the whatever game we're playing at Barrowfield finish at 1 30 or two o'clock you'd comfortably be in celtic park for three. Oh yeah definitely yeah Aye. half two you're pushing it but yeah three yeah mm. comfortable yeah. yeah the only problem with that is that so much of the kickoff times now are dictated by television and external factors that Celtic don't really have any control over. And the problem is a system like this with the coordination required between two venues, you're going to need to have so much, uh, how can I put it, um, so much knowledge ahead of time as to like the days and times that you're going to be doing it. And there's been times last season where literally we've had games switched one or two weeks before we've played them, you know, from a Saturday to a Sunday or whatever. And that's just not, it's not really conducive to this kind of thing. But, yeah, but you don't really, I mean, apart from, yeah, when you're playing in Europa League or Conference League, yeah, you've got that problem. But we're in the Champions League this year. We're not going to have any, other than TV, we won't have any need for Sunday games. Um, no, but... Uh, it was more the it was more the TV I was thinking of, like your your Sunday half twelve kickoff or your Saturday half twelve kickoff. But Champions also, League or not, that is still going to be an issue at some point. But remember, we're talking about Celtic home games, and it's almost exclusively out of away games that are on TV. Of course, yeah, that that's I, I, um, I, and the only two home games that are usually always guaranteed to be televised are the games against the Huns. Yeah. And on those games, I don't think you Celtic would get a license to have no. a, a, a drinks venue anywhere near the stadium on a day like that. So, yeah. Aye. No, probably yeah. not. No. Yeah. Just another yeah, question no, no, about yeah. Barrowfield, though. Mm -hmm. Is there much mm -hmm. around it or is it on near the river, right? Uh, it's the river? not that close to the river. Uh, no, I've, never just, walked, just... I've never walked to the other side of it, but it's a pretty wide open uh, space, you know? No, I'm just thinking because... Could you play under lights if you want to do a double header? So, say if you've got a half twelve kickoff, could you have a Colts or women's game after the after the men's game? So instead of having half twelve, it'll be over by what two thirty. Then you could have a kickoff for the women's at like four o'clock or whatever. And if you've got to put the lights on for the, for the end of it and finish at six o'clock or whatever, you could. You, you could, could make I'd say you'd get fewer people. Like, uh, if nothing else, you've spent your money already at Celtic Park. And also, there's a kind of a, an energy drop from a, a first team game to a B team game. So you're not, I mean, you're going to be kind of like, eh. Whereas if you're going before the Celtic game, you're like, right, I'm getting warmed up for the big game. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm there to 
have a drink and watch some football while I get prepared. You know, it's a build up. Well, I get prepared to watch more football. Yeah, yeah, I'm prepared to watch the big event. You know. I mean, it's a bit like it's a bit like the rock concert thing, isn't it? You know, the backing yeah. band are not going to go out after the Rolling Stones. You know, what I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. I think it's more that than anything. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah. You could chat it. I just think you would get less people. That's all. I don't expect you get a lot, but I was just thinking, like, if you wanted to do a double, you could, and we've got an early game, you could still have an Arvo game or whatever with the others. Well, look at uh, I checked, and this year the Colts were averaging 317 people. Uh, for home games so that's and that's you know half of those games clash with first team games do you know what i mean like so like literally clash like so with some clever scheduling and uh proximity to the the first team games that could increase like two or three times no problem i mean the thing is from our point of view as well as like fans who are not in scotland it makes Celtic TV a much more marketable product as well. See if there was some way you could, just hypothetically, right? Just say you had like the Colts were at eleven a.m., the women's game was at twelve, was at uh, twelve or one, and then the big team was like three or four. Being able to say to say to fans abroad, like, okay, for your subscription every weekend, basically you can sit down and watch three games of football in an afternoon. That would really, that would really have a lot more, because at the moment I I look at Celtic TV and this is going off and this is something we're going to talk about in a different section, of course, in a different time. But you know, it's not a very via, it's not it's not a very marketable product at the moment for the price point for what you're actually getting. And they have in recent times, for example, put in like the women's team playing a game as the build-up to a first-team game a couple of times. And I think that is something that should be happening every week because it immediately doubles your your the product that you're offering, you know? I'd, I'd you're, consider you're... actually getting it again if that was the case because it just does, it, it's not worth the money at the moment for what you get just no, for the, I... the one one. It's not like you've got the tool. Like if you look at, like, Man United TV, for instance, or Arsenal TV or whatever, they've got different shows within it as well, which you get on there. So you get like pre-match, you get post-match, you get, you know, behind the scenes, you get a bunch of other stuff. You get all the youth games, you get the reserve games, you get the first team games, you get the women's games. If you had all of that, I, the only reason I know that because I've got a mate who's a Man United fan. So he's showing me that one day and I'm like, that's ridiculous how much extra content they're getting for – their money compared to what we'd be paying for it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I, something I've not, not really thought about, which is what you're saying, match the experience of fans abroad. And look, uh, I don't want to say too much out loud here, but um, <laughs> in terms of uh, this Perth Supporters Club, like at the moment, everyone kind of goes to Anne Shibbon before the games and then heads along to Johnny Fox's for the game. Yeah, if the B team game's on and there's some music, why not open Johnny Fox's three hours before the game? You know, games will kick off at like 10 on a Saturday, right? If it's open at 7, there's a B-team game on. Why would people not be in three hours before instead of one hour before? or half Get in, you have a feed, watch another game, have a bit exactly. of a sing-song, a couple, exactly. extra, couple extra bevies and off you go. Yeah, it's not, it's not much more money for Celtic, really, other than extra subscribers. But, like, it's, um, yeah, it's good, better match the experience for us, definitely. You know, there's also the thing about, like, families and kids as well, like... I mean, I'm only speaking to my own experience here, but if I watch games with my wife, she is immediately more interested if there's a women's game on um, leading into the, the men's game because in Japan, women's football is actually held in almost equally high regard to men's football. And so she actually finds the women's game more of a an interesting curiosity than uh, than, than the men's team because she, you know, she only supports Celtic because I brought her into it, basically. Um she but I think, choice. well, yeah, um, you know, Celtic was part of the deal when when <laughs> when she got me, um, but no, the, uh, the 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 point I'm getting at is that, you know, I've got two young nieces as well who have got really into Celtic, and the women's team has been the gateway into that for them, um, and you know, I I think there must be a lot of, not just women, but a lot of people worldwide who maybe 
more of a product it's more is more of a, a draw which means more retention in terms of fans and i just think it's it's such a an opportunity that we really should be maximizing especially now that the women's team are actually winning things as well you know mm -hmm. yep okay so i'm going to take us in a bit of a circle uh, because i had a bit of a run order that i torched to do that segue which is really smooth right jared smooth segue yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh five 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 out of four uh okay so uh <laughs> what, what i was doing when i was putting together this list of improving the match the experience was i started with a there have been a lot of positive moves in recent years the singing section rail seating and then I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you guys have got anything that I can't think of that Celtic have actually done in the last 20 years to improve the match the experience. I've done it the Celtic way. Okay. Does, okay. I would, is that, yeah, I guess it's kind of match the experience. So you yeah, get that's there, true. That's much. You, you approach the stadium, it, it looks great that's with true. the lights in Christmas time and all that. That's, yeah. that's an improvement on walking up whatever it was beforehand. Okay, yeah, I'll give you that. So about the, the footfall, yeah. Anything else? I mean, the disco lights, is that? Okay, oh yeah, okay. Well, you know, I, I think in terms of the spectacle, that definitely adds something. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't I wasn't giving them enough credit. Okay, I just couldn't. <laughs> We've got four <laughs> things now. The other thing is, they need to, something they haven't done, but they need to, they need to do the ticket office, big time, make it easier for fans. Is that still the old shitty ticket office that they've always had? Is it still like the, the cabin? Yeah. yeah. So. The old white building, yeah. That's that's bad, man, that they're still using that. Uh, yeah, the old temporary structure. It used to be even worse when it was in with the pools. Like, jeez, man. You had the queue you had to, to get in there. It was crazy. Um, yeah, you're right. That needs to improve. But yeah, so anything else I'm not thinking of? No. Um, no. no. Um, oh, the pitch. They've improved the pitch. That's not matched it. Well, I guess it <laughs> They fixed the screens. It was for a long time there, only one screen was working. So they've got two working screens now. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So yeah, that's about it. let's get back onto my list then. Uh, so let's see. We could start with uh, the one that I think, well, let's get a controversial one out of the way. Out of the way. Okay, hmm. alcohol. Okay, so yeah. alcohol for anyone that doesn't know was banned uh, for plebs after the 1980 Scottish Cup final riot between Celtic and Rangers fans. Um, still, you can still get alcohol if you pay for the posh seats, uh, but other than that, it's banned. Uh, now, my argument is this is a bit of an outdated uh, ban. We've moved on culturally, I think, uh, and also. I don't think banning alcohol stops fans from rioting. So let's have a look at the uh, Sevco versus Hibs Cup final as an example. Uh, still rioted, still had the horses on the pitch and there was no alcohol on sale in the stadium that day. And we now also have the option of what we do in, here in Australia, which is we serve mid-strength beer at games. Now, that really does, I think, massively make a difference. I, I think... Having been in Scotland and USA, and not living, but visited Scotland, USA, Middle East, Australia for sporting events, that is, to me, a massive difference, having the mid-strength alcohol on sale. It really is. And also, having the ban on alcohol, I believe, pushes people towards consuming high-density, concealable alcohol, e.g. a half bottle of vodka. Whereas they might just go in and have a couple of pints of mid-strength, but oh, it's banned, I'll just have a half bottle of vodka instead. So I think it actually might encourage irresponsible drinking to have it banned. What's okay. you? i got two things on the back of that, Sean. Go for it. You've also got the whole, it encourages people to sneak their drinks in, i.e. all the bottles of Buckfast at Ibrox earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. Like that, to me, is ridiculous. Like people bringing in glass bottles where if you had mid-strength beer or whatever going, then it's under control. But the other thing, mm -hmm. and you're talking about booze, alcohol is not going to be the only thing that could potentially cause a riot because there's a whole lot of people going to the football these days, coked off their off their asses because 
you know, they can't get a drink at the game, but I want I want something. So they're doing other dodgy shit. So, you Fair know, point. one thing leads mm. to another. Yeah. And yeah, and I think with you, with the ages of us, we don't we don't realise like how much younger people these days are actually going to the white powder. I, th- I think that's maybe something we're a little bit out of touch with. That is something that um, I don't know about the situation at Celtic, but I know people who who work at Ibrox and at Rangers, and they've said that the amount of guys just openly doing coke in the toilets during during the games is just ridiculous apparently they having a drink while they're in there as well i'll have a i'll have a i'll have a pound of coke and a, a pint of pish <laughs> no um the uh the thing about the drinking and the thing is i can actually speak to this directly right i go to japanese football games fairly regularly or i, I did before COVID. um and I was a season ticket holder at Celtic Park for, for a few years. And I was one of those guys who, because I couldn't drink at the game, I would go for a pint before the game. And I'd usually end up going for a pint after the game if we won as well. And in Japan, you can buy drink throughout the game, before, during, after, whatever. I mean, in the bigger stadiums, there are actually, there are actually people who bring literally bring the beer to your seat, right? Um, so you can sit there, watch the game, sip your pint, no problem, right? And I probably drink on average two or three, the equivalent of maybe two or three pints at a Japanese football game from like the time I get there to the time I go home. Whereas my day out at the match, a Celtic match, would probably involve at least double that because it would be two or three pints before the game probably the same again after more if we've you know just beat the huns or won the cup or something you know um but in japan because it's always there isn't the same desire for it if you know what i mean it's it's mm-hmm. like being told you can't have something what's the first thing you want you know it's the thing you're told you can't have whereas if it's just always sitting there you're like oh, I'll, I'll have a pint in about 10 minutes i don't need one just now i've still got this one you know um and it's it's definitely definitely a, it's a it's, it's it's as much a psychological thing as anything else. But knowing that you can have a drink whenever you want actually makes you less inclined to do so. I think I can, I can honestly speak on that. I'll go to the A League games here, Liam, and I can get a drink whenever I want. Mm-hmm. Some games I'll go and I don't even have one because I'm like, if I want a beer or, or whatever, I can go get it. But a lot of times you get in the game and you're just like, nah, I don't feel like it at the moment. That's not making me do it. But if I was to go to a game in Scotland, yeah, I'd probably do what you guys are doing, have a drink before, one or two there, and then, you know, do the same deal after. And to add to what you're saying, Jared, and, uh, I don't know if you go to any AFL games, but it's like the four quarters, and the, each quarter's uh, like a half hour for anyone that's uh, outside Scotland. Uh, so, like, I'll have a pint in the first quarter, have a pint in the second quarter, have a pint in the third quarter, and then by the fourth quarter, I'm like, actually, do you know what? I'm okay now. Like, do you know what I mean that? Like, I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't know. Do you know what I mean like it's? Do you sober up last quarter? And it, yeah, and it's all mid strength as well. So you're barely even. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, you know, you've had like two units of alcohol or whatever. Like really. Just really just for the sake of spot. clarity, what what percentage is mid strength by 3%. Australian standards? Three percent, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and a pint's not normally a pint here. It's normally, uh, well, a, a pint is a pint, obviously, but like in a stadium, it's like four forty mm. usually. Right. I mean, regular lager here in Japan is only like four, four and a half percent anyway. So hmm. um, that's what they serve in the stadiums here. Um, and again, probably the heat and the humidity has got something to do with it as well. But I have, I don't think I've ever actually felt drunk at a, at a Japanese game, even if I've had maybe four or five pints instead of the two or three, hmm. because you just sweat it out with the heat, you know. Um, and we're all overlooking the fact that we'd get more money if we were selling alcohol in the stadium. Yeah. Increase, increase revenue. And not just from the fact people are buying more things, like you had a couple of pints, oh, I need a pie. Do you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Have pints, so give me some chips, get me a, yeah. give me a hot exactly. dog, whatever. Yeah. And which kind of links to the next one, if you're ready to move on from alcohol, um, mm. which is internal renovations. Like Celtic Park is 
what was it made in 95, 96, about something like that. Completed in 98, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was completed oh, in 98. Okay. It was completed okay. in 98, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, internal renovations would be the next kind of thing on the list because even though, you know, it's a pretty good stadium, there's certainly room for improvement inside in terms of kiosks and things like that. And not really, it's more of an observation rather than something we can actually do. But if you look at other uh, modern stadiums that are made, uh, if you look at uh, the new Op- uh, Optus Stadium out here in WA, what they've got is massive concourse areas inside, which allow for a lot more kiosks like the whole way, it's literally kiosks and bars the whole way around the stadium. And I mean, literally. Like, other than stairs coming in, it's just like an unbroken ring of kiosks all the way around the stadium. Whereas Celtic Park is like four pie stalls or whatever for 60,000 people. Do you know what I mean? Like, we could be doing so much better in that sense. The problem might be that the infrastructure of the stadium is too old to implement that. Uh, and if you look at uh, even things like, again, AFL, Within the stadium, you've got bars with big screens. So I was at uh, an Aussie Rose game with my dad two years ago. Uh, Eagles were absolutely flogging. Uh, Demons, call them it. I can't remember who it was. Got a bit bored in the third quarter, so we just went to the bar and just watched what was on the TV in the bar and had a pint and went back to our seats for the final quarter. Do you know what I mean? Like, having stuff like that. Um, even if you think about, like, NFL and what they're doing with all the new stadiums, is it's like every new stadium is like a game of oh, what can I, oh, right, that stadium's got all these things, I'm going to get all that, and what can I do that makes this one better? Do you know what I mean? So if you go to like a Jacksonville Jaguars game or Miami Dolphins game, they've literally got hot tubs that you can watch the game from. You can hire, you can pay for a hot tub to sit and watch the game in and they'll bring drinks to your hot tub. Now, I'm not saying that's fine for Celtic Park, but I'm just <laughs> saying like that's the kind of internal renovations and innovations that, the other sports are doing to improve the match day experience. I don't know how we could do that or anything similar, but that's what other sports are doing. Well, what's going on, Sean? Like, you have a look, like what you're talking about with all the food and beverage outlets and that around at Optus Stadium and that over in Perth. And then you look at the MCG and that over here and it's the same deal. But what they've done at the MCG is had these real big concourses around the outside of the stadium that they've done up. So what they've actually done is the bar, they've, opened it up so it's like a permanent fence on the outside like fence and a wall okay. and that so they extended the bars outside the stadium onto the concourses so that it frees up the room in the stadium so people can still move around really easily so they've done that now that's something that they could look at at celtic park if there's enough room around the stadium there's so much room because yeah. the stadium where we're um a core stadium in sydney the old 2000 Olympics stadium in Homebush. Now, that's a similar sort of setup. Sorry, Jared, I've lost you. Can't hear you. No. Is it just me? No, Jared's No, I, I, yeah, no he's gone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, so, yeah, what Jared was actually mm. saying was links, uh, kind of links to my next point, which was, mm. like, sorry, not links, as my next point, which yeah. was talking about the stadium footprint. Um, so yeah. he's saying that that's what they do at the MCG and if, if you look at um, Celtic Park there is just this big concrete expanse around the stadium they've got that car park right out the front on Kerrydale Street I don't know mm-hmm. who parks there, they don't need to be parking there send them somewhere else, you know what I mean they're going to have that, they've got the underground uh, disabled area coming in for parking but yeah. that's like prime estate like, as Jared said you can fence that off that can become uh, you know, you could have you been at a game at Murrayfield, Liam? Uh, yes, I have. I, I right. So, I, the ga- the games at it's, the, the SRU games at Murrayfield, they've got this massive mm-hmm. fenced off area that's just full of food and drinks. And do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. great. You go in like an hour, two hours before the game, you can have a drink and wander around, a bit of food. It's great. I mean, when I went to see Man City play in Yokohama a couple of years ago, when Ange was managing Yokohama, actually, mm-hmm. um. The uh, it was it was maybe about a quarter of a mile before you actually got to the stadium, where there was a ticket checkpoint, and yeah. beyond that you go in and it's just all kiosks, drinks, food, merchandise, um, everything, and mm. even the smaller clubs in Japan have got that on a smaller scale. Like like Jared was saying, you walk right round the park, 
and there's all manner of different food and drink stalls. Um, because one of the big things, the big differences for me between like going to a game in Japan and going to a game at Celtic is Celtic, at least last time I was there, had a total lack of diversity. Every kiosk sold the same stuff. Yeah, and it was, yeah. and you one, know, it's, one supplier. I basically you you've you've got, you can have a pie, you can have a hot dog, or you can have a pie and a hot dog if you really want to push the boat out, you know. And the um, vegetarian option is chips. Aye, basically. <laughs> um, and it's like, do you want do you want your do you want your Coca Cola? Do you want it? With, you know, too much syrup or far too much syrup? You know. <laughs> but the the thing is, in Japan, like I mean, j- just use an example on a much much smaller scale, right? Matsumoto Yamaga, Daisen's old team, right? Last time I went to see them was about eighteen months ago, and they have that idea. You go through. A sort of an archway and you show your ticket and that's you then from an official standpoint within the stadium although you're still technically outside the stadium structure right right around that it's like okay stop here i can have a hot dog walk 30 yards down the street i can have a hamburger i can have a curry i can have Mm. fried chicken i could have uh sandwiches sushi boxes you know everything imaginable um and also it was the same with the drink you know do i want to have a pint of like german pilsner do i want to have like the the, the official green yamaga st patrick's day style pint do you know do i want to have like a uh like the, the japanese equivalent of like a bacardi breeze or a chuhai you know there, there's like all these different things and it's literally like you go to this stall to get that thing so if you're a season ticket holder, you know, right, okay, that's where I go to get my curry. That's where I go to get my my vodka mixer. That's where I go to get a pint. That's where I go to get a, a hot dog, you know. Whereas in Celtic, like you say, everywhere it's just the same. It's like this or or don't eat, basically. Yeah, I mean, I've not been to a game since before COVID, but the last time I went, it was the same thing that it's been for the 10 years before. And that was the only thing around Celtic Park was the Superstore, couple of burger vans, the turnstiles bar, and a guy with a tin whistle, who is, <laughs> you, you know right. the guy? Yeah, and like, so it's so, still the same as it was in 2012 last time I was at a game. <laughs> yeah, so, not much changed really. And there's uh, just so much concrete space there that they could, what Jared's mentioning, they could just be putting up, and what you've said, Liam, putting up ticket checkpoints, getting security, having a licensed area, I get that it's Scotland and it's raining, but put up a flipping gazebo. Do you know what I mean? Like, get get an in, get some space heaters in there. They do it in George uh, George Square and uh, what's the other place uh, outside Socky Hall? Do you know what I'm talking aye, about? The, the, uh, aye, the fruit market. Is it the fruit market? Um, the Christmas market. I don't know what it's called. But anyway, they do it aye. in the middle of Glasgow. People are aye. willing to stand outside and drink if you give them a heater and a shelter. Do you know what I mean? Get it done. There's so much, so much to keep you doing there. I'm not having this at all. That we can't be doing this. I'm not having it at all. Well, what yeah. though? You know what I was saying about the stadium in Sydney, of course, stadium where the um, where Celtic was supposed to be playing Rangers later in the year. What they do is they've got the real narrow walkways around the stadium, but then they don't have when they've got big games like the NRL Grand Final, right? What I was going to say is. They open some of the doors outside. They get temporary fencing put in. They put a cover on. They got seating, and they set up bars and stuff out there as well. So it doesn't even have to be permanent. But if you've got the room to do it and the funds to do it, why not? Mm-hmm. Like make a permanent thing, yeah. like you've got the MCG. But there's also ways around it. So there's no real excuse. I mean, that was the point I was making, Jared, while you were away. Is that when I went to see Man City in Japan, they did exactly the same thing about about quarter mile before you actually get to the stadium proper was a checkpoint and beyond that everything was just yeah. was was self-contained and, and the the same thing we said before about battlefield that the idea of having people drinking at battlefield just put up a large screen outside celtic park have a bar lots of tables you know can be inside outside whatever like there you go you can have 500 people standing drinking watching a big screen with whatever games on that day or even just a rerun of whatever you know Maybe even fucking a Wolf Tones concert, whatever. Do you know, like we're all we're all stereotypes at Celtic Park. Just they know what we want. Um, but yeah, like even the in the summer, 
have things, have activities for the kids. Do you know what I mean? Like you go to Optus Stadium, you have the kids doing the kick the ball into the nets and shit like that. Face painting, all that stuff. Like I know oh, that's a sore topic in Glasgow. Painters. Yeah, <laughs> they're all they're all out of business in Glasgow. I know, but like you get the idea. Like you can in yeah. summer you can do these things, but there's so much they could be doing. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like part of the problem might be that if they try to apply for these things, the local residents will complain and da 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 da. But I don't know. Maybe part of it. Maybe we need to move. Maybe Celtic Park. Maybe we need to move to Campbell's Lang, what we were talking about before. You know, like, could we be doing so much more if we were outside residential area? Probably. I mean, it, it takes a bit of the soul away, for sure. But thing is, though, apart from apart from the graveyard, I think all the area around, immediately around Celtic Park is largely undeveloped, and I'm pretty sure we own most of it. Mm, you don't, but you don't have to go far for residential. Is what I mean. Like, no, in, no, true, true. Res, residential is, is concerned not about people drinking outside their house, but people drinking them walking past their house, kind of thing. Mm. Like a thousand people emptying out. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't, I, you know, no offense to anybody who lives in Parkhead or has lived there, but I don't exactly see house prices crashing because a few drunks walk by. You know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like eighteen times a year. Do you know what I mean? It's not like it's eighteen home games or whatever. Yeah. All I have to say is they can all get a bunch of cement tablets, harden up, get on with it. Have you have you ever seen tailgating at American football? Do you know what that is? Oh, that's insane. Yeah, and that's what it is. It's just a big concrete area, and it's and like you drive up. Sean, it's even worse at yeah. that. It's insane. Yeah. But it's it's literally. The, the team don't even do anything. It's just a fan culture thing. They drive up to this big area that's open space and they come up like up as early as six hours before the game. They park up their RV, their ute, whatever, uh, get out of the barbecue. Some of them have music, some of them have TVs, and you can just walk around the car park, see what other people are doing, getting foods, sharing drinks, whatever. It's like this is big, um, massive pop up social a lot of, experience. Yeah. A lot of man love going on, people just having general cuddles. The odd a yeah. bit of an argument. It's just great. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's like an Oktoberfest that, that pops up in a car park like eight times a year because they, they have very few home games over there, obviously. Uh, and you, you, it leads to quite some funny shenanigans. If you want to look at Buffalo Bills fans and add the word tables to your search, you you can be entertained for many hours. Uh, <laughs> the, the ongoing war between Buffalo Bills fans and tables. You see what I mean when you Google it? <laughs> yeah, and uh, all the, all that is is just a big bit of concrete and a culture that's just developed around it. The club doesn't really do anything other than provide the concrete. Do you know what I mean? We, I'm not saying we could do that because you know drink driving, but um, it's, it's, there's you know there's opportunities there if you have space. I mean, would you would you want to move? Honestly, I don't know. Like, I, I kind of like being able to walk back into Glasgow after the game if I'm at it. But would you have a better experience? I don't really see the point doing it, Sean, for one main reason. Even if we were to build a brand new, shiny, billion-dollar stadium like what Tottenham's got, we're not going to get extra seats out of it. Why not? That's the thing like, well, currently we're at 60,000. You build a similar mm -hmm. same same sort of thing to what they've got, cost them a billion at 60,000 seats. So it's not really – you'd have to yep. – But they're building theirs in, they built theirs in London though, right? They didn't move. Yeah. They build on the same ground. Yes, right? I'm saying. So if we move to where there's more space, so you did what Arsenal did. You go like yeah, away from Highbury. Yeah, I don't know. I just I just don't. It doesn't seem right to me. One of the main issues with that, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I think is part of Celtic Park not a listed building. I it yeah, can't thought... be. So my point is, like, if Celtic were going to move somewhere else, they would need to sell that. And you can't really sell a football stadium if it can't be anything other than a football stadium. You don't have to sell it. You can just abandon it. Well, I bet. But there's plenty of listed buildings in Glasgow that are just a facade held up by, uh, like, steel girders stopping them from falling down. Do you know what I mean? Like... I just think that, like, based on what I've seen in Japan, like, the area around Celtic Park that is usable right, is similar to the area around the Nissan Stadium. I mean, the Nissan Stadium is right in the middle of the city centre. It is about a five-minute, well, maybe about a 15-minute walk from the, from, the, from the main bullet train station in Yokohama. You know, mm -hmm. it's 
it's not like one of these out in the out in the suburbs kind of things. You know, you can do uh, an inter an, a, 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 a city centre stadium that utilises the space properly, provided you plan it properly, and it's all in the planning. Because Celtic, particularly out the front of the stadium where the Celtic Way is, and where the old jungle behind the old jungle, I'm sure you could knock that wall down and build that out a wee bit as well. Um, there is definitely enough space there to do something very similar to what Nissan Stadium has. And Nissan Stadium actually has got a bigger capacity. I think that's about 85,000. Um, but oh. it's a very similar layout in terms of the available real estate to, to what Celtic Park would have if they utilised it fully. Well, whether we choose to do it or not, I think we could blackmail the council into letting us do more with the land if we have that threat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many jobs is that going to create? You know, all these extra yeah. bars, all these extra kiosks. That's, you know, a couple of hundred jobs probably. Then there's Millions. the construction work to set it up. Millions for the economy every year. Um, and, and look, we're talking, I, I get we are talking about all these kind of innovations that we're picking up from other sports. And one thing we need to do consider is that just the different culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Every other sport we've mentioned so far, all of them have co mingled fans in the stands. Not something we do in Scottish football. We do no. not call Mingle fans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's some funny shit. <laughs> I mean, uh, even just it, like. Put a few Porter Lewis at the Rangers end for them to have a drink as well, and we'll be fine, you know? Yeah, so we do need to consider that there's historical, cultural things going on here. Uh, another thing that, I, that popped up on my list, and I don't know if you want me to go into too much detail on it, was football tourism and whether Celtic should engage in it. Now, I had a look at the biggest uh, provider of football tourism that I could, as far as I could tell, which was sportsbreaks.com, who already work with Man United, Liverpool, Chelsea, Spurs, SRU, NFL, and curiously, Sevco. Um, so what that would be is like you have partner hotels, with sportsbreak.com, they've got their own partners. So if we wanted to run our own one, it goes back to the Peter Lawwell hotel idea where you can actually get a weekend break out of uh, a visiting fan. Uh, now, if people are apparently paying to come in as tourists to watch Sevco, then surely we could do double the number that they're doing uh, is a fan base that is actually worldwide. So I, I quickly put together in my head a package that uh, people might pay for. So you say two nights at the Celtic Hotel, uh, match day tickets, uh, museum tour, gift pack in your hotel, which would have a home strip and a scarf, dinner at number seven restaurant, and a meet and greet with a Celtic legend. Okay. And I kind of priced out those things individually. And if you individually add them up, it adds up to about £450 per person if you were buying each of those things individually. Uh, now, say you sold 100 of those per match, that's £45,000 per match. And at the moment, the cost for a match day package, so no hotel, no scarf, no meat, the, the cost for a match day package of sitting in the, uh, sitting in the, uh, uh, the, sitting in the fancy seats or staying for dinner is like 100 to 300 pounds already. So this is uh, kind of a different way you could bring people in for a match day experience is, you know, do we want football tourism as part of our match day experience? Now, one issue with this, which I don't, I don't personally have an issue with, but I think is going to upset a lot of people, is that if you are selling packages of like coming to uh, coming to Glasgow to see Celtic, there are going to be people who don't have any affiliation one way, one way or the other, who are going to want to come to see a Celtic game and a Rangers game for comparison purposes which means there is going to be cross-pollination in terms of marketing. There is going to have to be some form of collaboration at some point. And that is going to upset a large section of our support and a large section of their support as well. And I think it's a bit myopic to look at it that way because anything that makes money for the club without harming the brand is a good thing. But are we harming the brand by potentially getting in bed with Rangers in that respect? Hmm. Well, if we do it ourselves, we're not. 
yeah. yeah, so not to dwell on it too long because this could come into a different pod that we're talking about. Uh, so I'll just wrap up with one th last thing, okay? And that is kind of linked to what we're saying. And the, the last thing that doesn't help you I, or I is the, something that's on a lot of, a hot topic for a lot of fans to improve match day experience is more affordable tickets. The 20s mm -hmm. plenty campaign. And that's really the last thing I want to mention uh, because it rightly probably should be the, the most achievable and certainly um most important for working class fans is part of your match the experience well if i if i might jump in here i've got a very i've got a model for this which works in japan and could easily be applied to scotland in japan it is the j league that set the ticket prices not the clubs and every game in the j league has the same pricing so it's um it starts at as little as two and a half thousand yen which is like 20 uh 25 us dollars so about what about 15 quid something like that for your basic ticket which doesn't which doesn't include an assigned seat but gets you into the game gets you into a certain section and then it's up to you to find your own seat. <laughs> um, the uh, but then it goes up to five thousand yen, which is about thirty quid, which is then like your pre-assigned seat, your you know uh, that kind of thing. And then you go up in tiers. Like if you want a trackside seat, that's another like level up again. If you want a seat with like the ultras, that's another tier. Um, and they're all priced differently, but the prices the prices are fixed. They are based on the median income of the average worker in Japan in terms of affordability. Um, now Japan has a has a slightly higher medium income than Scotland, which is why, even though I'm quoting prices that I think are reasonable, you might think they still sound a bit expensive. Um, and also those prices are reviewed on an annual basis by every club in the league. And it is a collaborative effort. And that is the way it should be run, I think, because it's ridiculous that we pay more than other teams do to go and see, to go to the same stadium and sit in the same seat, if you know what I mean. Um, and likewise, I'm pretty sure that St. Johnson fans or St. Mirren fans don't like the fact that they have to pay a hell of a lot more just because they're coming to Celtic Park. You know, I think definitely there should be a homogenization of ticket prices across the board. This, this sounds like Liam promoting socialism or anti-capitalism. That's never happened before. Well, I've got mm. a couple of points. I've got a couple of points. <laughs> right? Okay. What you're saying about the prices and the tiers and all that, we've got that over here for like the A-League and all that, right? So that makes perfect sense. Like similar over here. Yeah. But our prices aren't capped like the way across the league because over here our clubs don't own their stadiums. So each club's cost for their stadium to operate are going to be different. Like mm. I, as an exercise, I had a look at it. And if you play at Amy Park in Melbourne, which is where Victory City and uh, Western United were playing this season, you need a minimum 11,000 people in that stadium to break even. Mm. So if that's the case, you need to cost it to make sure you're breaking even at that. Now, Victory's got the largest supporter base in the league. We got about twenty something thousand members. So each game, even if we weren't we're only getting fifteen, sixteen thousand to a game, we're still making money because of the season books that are sold plus the tickets that are being sold on the gate. But then you've got the other two Melbourne teams are lucky to get ten thousand people to a game. So they're losing money every time they play. So they of course their prices, they're gonna to want to put them up a bit higher to try and cover their costs. So <coughs> That's where it's a bit it's a bit awkward, but then if you look at Adelaide, they're the only ones who use Hindmarsh Stadium in Adelaide, so their costs for their stadium are going to be a lot lower than the, all three of the Melbourne clubs, and then the Sydney clubs it's the same deal again. They're going to be expensive, so yeah, it's just all interesting to see how it works out. But like yeah, what you're saying about the tiers, yeah, I agree with you on that, but I can't see how costs. Costs are going to be different per stadium. You look at Scotland, all the clubs own their stadiums, right? 
So if you've got I someone like Farzano, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if you've got, if you look at Livy, their cost to open their stadium up fully is going to be a lot lower than opening up Celtic Park fully or opening up Ibrox. So I love your idea, your socialism. You know, prices are nice across the league, but if you're going to do that because of the bigger stadiums, it's probably going to lift up the prices of those smaller clubs. Mm, yeah, but I would have thought, no, again, math isn't my strong point, but I would have thought that, for example, Levy have an average crowd of, say, 4,000, whereas Celtic have an average crowd of 55,000. Levy get 4,000? Was... I'm just using that as an oh, example. Yeah. <laughs> right? Isn't that going to then scale accordingly? Yeah, higher open, higher setup costs, but higher revenue because there's more people there. Well, that's a whole other debate for a whole other topic on exactly. the revenue it's thing. A whole yeah. another podcast. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty well, of that... ideas and ways we can it can be done, but at the end of the day, I, yeah, it, it is what it is. There you go. Livingston's last home game, the attendance is 1,629. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, dear. Anyway, <laughs> anyway we'll, uh, we'll, is there anything else you want to add, Sean, to finish it yeah. up? We're gonna it covers it up. everything, mate. Yeah, I'm all good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. There'll be two more episodes in this series coming out soon, so keep an eye out. Uh, thanks, Liam. Thanks, Sean. How, how? Hell, hell. Hell, hell. Go a bit.